Hi, everyone. Welcome to Microbial Minutes. This is the Llama Llama Mega Gama edition. This is the American Society for Microbiology's every couple of weekly update on what's hot in the microbial sciences. I'm Julie Wolf, a science communication specialist here at ASM. Today is November 13th, 2018. Uh, and I've called this the Llama Llama Mega Gamma or Mega Gamma, really, if we're talking about um, immunoglobulins, because one of our stories today has to do with immunoglobulins and antibodies from llamas. So let's talk about uh, what's hot in the microbial sciences. Today, we're going to cover some antibiotic resistant bacteria among megafauna, so big animals. Uh, and then we'll talk about mega antibodies from llamas um, that can protect from influenza. Then we will move uh, more into influenza and other seasonal uh, diseases, talking about epidemic, um, epidemic sorry, calendars. Uh, and finally, we will end with a couple stories on microbiomes and the role of ethnicity in shaping the microbiome. Let's dive right in. Our first story is from ASM's Applied and Environmental Microbiology, uh, titled Assessing Transmissional or Transmission of Antimicrobial Resistant Escherichia coli in Wild Giraffe Contact Networks. Take home message, I always like to get that uh, front and center, is that wild giraffes are colonized with drug resistant bacteria. Um, and so, like all living organisms, giraffes have natural microbiota. They have bacteria that make up their skin, their gut, their um, nasal cavity uh, niches, and that serves a purpose in keeping them healthy. Uh, and so this group wanted to look at whether drug-resistant microbes were part of those microbiomes. Um, as part of a One Health initiative trying to understand how drug-resistant bacteria have um, affected various niches around the world. And they're also interested in understanding where those drug-resistant microbes may have come from. Uh, and so this was done in wild giraffes. This was not done in uh, giraffes that, for example, live in zoos. Uh, and it was done as part of a health assessment um, of a number of different characteristics of giraffe, wild, wild giraffe um, health. Uh, so the giraffes were swabbed and they were checked to see whether or not they were carrying E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria that lives in the environment and colonizes the gastrointestinal tracts of just about all um, animals and mammals. Uh, and so just about all mammals, excuse me. Um, and it turns out that yes, um, some of those Escherichia coli, some of those E. coli isolates are drug resistant. Uh, about 5% of the isolates that were um, that were grown had resistance to at least one antimicrobial agent. Uh, and so here in the, one of their data tables, you can see that the, the giraffes are numbered uh, so that they can differentiate the different animals that they're sampling from. And then they looked at the different types of antibiotic resistance um, that these isolates had. And some had um, various types of, of resistance. The, um, the scientists then wanted to look at whether those different and, um, plasmids that were carrying antibiotic resistance determinants were associated with, um, let's say, animal, livestock associated isolates or human associated isolates. And, and they went on to sequence some of these um, and did not find one particular plasmid or, or plasmid family that was most common. It seems as though uh, there are a number of different types of plasmids that are being passed around within the um, giraffe population, which also indicates that there is multiple sources. So there's not just a single source of these drug-resistant E. coli that are colonizing um, the, the giraffes. The, the um, researchers were wondering whether or not they hypothesized that there was some sort of um, characteristic of the animals that might give them a propensity to be colonized, a, that might make them more susceptible. And so they looked at both the, the social structure, um, so giraffes um, that live in groups have social structures, um, and the age of these animals. Uh, and so in one of their figures, they, they charted the age in days of animals and the social degree. And of course, younger animals tend to have less social stature. Um, and they found that younger giraffes tend to be colonized with these drug-resistant isolates at a higher rate than older giraffes, which uh, is somewhat curious, especially as some of the, the very young um, giraffes are still um, being fed, um, they're still drinking the, the milk from their moms that will contain some of the antibodies conferring, um, 
conferring immunity to, to different uh, types of bacteria and, and other types of microbes. Uh, nevertheless, the authors suspect that the um, there might be some sort of immune deficiency in these younger animals, uh, or perhaps they, because of their lower social um, stature, they have a different type of exposure than the older animals. Uh, and so you might be asking, why, why are we highlighting um, wild giraffes harboring uh, drug-resistant bacteria? Uh, and there's a number of reasons. Um, the first is the implications uh, of these being wild animals. So these are not animals that are being treated with um, antimicrobials. They are not being selected for carrying different types of, uh, of drug-resistant isolates. There's no drugs um, that are going to give those, those plasmid-bearing E. coli any type of fitness advantage. Uh, and so that um, is one um, concern. There, there may be some sort of environmental factor that selects for these drug-resistant isolates um, in a way that that also allows them to propagate that that drug resistance, uh, and so in that case, um, the to that end, the scientists suspect that there might be an association of iron stress um, and the the ability of iron stress to select for some of these drug resistant plasmids um, in the E. coli isolates, uh, and that is something that they are going to follow up with. Um, it is also of concern because we need to understand where these different um, isolates came from? Is there uh, com contaminated waterways? Is there um, uh, livestock interaction uh, between giraffes and livestock that are being treated with, with antibiotics? Uh, and so all of those are different avenues for this, this research group to follow up on. So it's um, discussed in several different outlets, both by scientists who study uh, molecular um, genetics of bacteria, as well as those who are concerned with the environment. Um, and it was picked up by Vice's motherboard. This is a, a usually tech-heavy um, magazine from Vice. Uh, and when I first read the the headline, I thought this is this looks like a great piece of science communication. You see, that it says antibiotic resistant E. coli have infected giraffes. Um, please, for the love of God, be smart with your antibiotics. And I'm always for um, good stewardship of antibiotics to be um, conveyed in different types of science communication pieces. Uh, but then if you look into the body of the, the text, you can see that the, the way that it is worded, in this case, 5.1% of the giraffes were resistant to antibiotics, uh, suggests that there is something about the giraffes that resist drug treatment instead of the bacteria that colonize the giraffes being resistant to the, the drug treatment. And this is a common misconception in um, the non-scientific public and is often perpetrated by phrasing such as this. Um, uh, fortunately, the piece did get the conclusions, the major conclusions of the piece um, correct, stating that the, the problem with these um, infected giraffes is that they could spread these antibiotic resistant E. coli to agriculture, um, animals that humans eat, uh, and humans directly, although I don't know how much actual human giraffe uh, interaction there is with wild giraffes. Uh, it's true that they, the giraffes could be a source of these drug resistant um, isolates and importantly, um, could be contracting it from some of those sources as well. Moving on, our next piece is from Science, titled Universal Protection Against Influenza Infection by a Multi-Domain Antibody to Influenza Hemagglutinin. And the take-home message uh, from this piece is that special mega-antibodies may hold the key to the flu, flu cure. Uh, and so we're talking about a treatment for flu, um, which we know needs better treatments, uh, as well as improved vaccines. So vaccines prevent the disease from taking place, uh, and treatments can help to prevent very bad um, consequences of being infected. We've discussed how there is a new um, therapy for influenza that has just been approved, uh, a one-day or one-time dose that, that um, cures people or, or relieves symptoms a little bit faster than um, currently available Tamiflu and other um, antiviral compounds. Um, and what this particular therapy is doing is looking at antibodies. And this is very interesting because antibodies are often talked about in vaccine um, and prevent preventative um, measures, but this is actually an antibody uh, that can target the, the same area, the same um, part of the influenza particle uh, that some of the vaccines are looking to target. So most antibodies, which um, is a, a small molecule made by your, your immune system, target a very specific epitope or 
region of a an influenza particle or whatever um, protein or particle it's it's um, targeting. In this case, if we're looking at a schematic of influenza virus, see that there is the HA or hemagglutinin on the outer um, envelope of the of the influenza particles. This is the glycoprotein that is responsible for binding to the cell receptor and internalizing that influenza particle. Uh, and this um, HA or hemagglutinin particle has a, a number of different epitopes uh, to which antibodies can bind. It can bind to this like little bump in the middle, can bind to this stalk part um, around here um, underneath. Uh, and variation in the sequences um, is one of the things that helps the flu to escape um, antibody activity. It's also one of uh, different variants of this HA uh, are what give the the seasonal influenza and, and, and influenza in general the different um, H nomenclature. So the, the H5 or the H1 is indicating the hemagglutinin um, type that is incorporated in that particular influenza strain. Uh, so the goal in general for, for antibodies is to find those that can be broadly neutralizing. That means not only binding to H1, uh, the hemagglutinin 1, but also binding to hemagglutinin 5. So that any antibody that is effective against one strain of influenza would be effective against another strain of influenza as well. Um, and so what what would happen in this case is that the virus would effectively be neutralized. Um, in this case, we see the antibody, which has two different regions that can recognize um, the, the specific part of the protein to which it binds. And it would bind to this HA, hopefully, um, and stop the influenza particle from being able to bind to the cell receptor. So this is the cell. A part of it is shown here with the different receptors to which influenza might be able to bind, except those uh, antibodies are blocking that interaction from occurring. Now these influenza, or I'm sorry, these antibodies that are binding to influenza are quite big. These are what the human antibodies look like, these two different arms, um, which can have variable regions and the constant region here. Um, but if we look at antibodies that are generated by other animals, they have different types of shapes. Uh, and this is where the llamas come into play. Llamas generate antibodies as well um, that are specific to a very, um, very specific, that, that bind to a very specific portion of um, a particular protein. In this case, they were looking for llama antibodies that bind to HA. But llama antibodies are much smaller than human antibodies. Uh, and so the idea that these uh, this scientific group had was that by using some of these smaller antibodies, the um, antibodies might better be able to be bound together or tied together um, to make some broadly neutralizing antibodies because uh, there are several different recognition parts of the antibody tied together. Uh, and so this was their first proof of principle um, experiment where they took different antibodies from the llama, which are named just uh, by numbers, 36, 38, 83, 84. Uh, and they looked at, in singular, what the uh, inhibitory concentration was. So how, how much antibody did it take um, in animals? in order to inhibit half of the um, influenza strain, and they're looking at a number of different strains here because they want to find something broadly neutralizing, how much um, is the 50% uh, inhibitory concentration? And you can see that for the single um, antibodies, many of them take more than 1,000 nanomolar or uh, more than uh, one micromolar of antibody, which is quite a bit um, when talking about using concentrations. But if they combined even two of these, they were able to get much greater uh, inhibition um, and they needed much less antibody in order to reach that 50% threshold. And so what they thought was, hey, well, if two sections of these smaller llama antibodies work well, maybe we could even tie together more. And so in this case, they tied together four of them, all four of these that they're showing you. And you can see that the inhibitory concentration um, as still shown along the y-axis here, for all of those different um, all of those different flu strains, uh, which are now shown along the x-axis, are now quite low. Um, and only in one case does it reach up as high as a thousand. In many cases, and this is logarithmic, it would be between um, 10 and 100. Um, so uh, much more effective as a chain of four small antibodies than a chain of uh, one or two. There does seem to be a limit um, for this. So they tied together um, a number of these different um, recognition sites that are going to bind to different parts of the, of the influenza 
um, HAs. Uh, and they saw that it didn't really help a whole lot if they tied together for um, eight of these instead of four. Um, however, uh, they did see that it, it, it certainly was more effective to use either of these llama antibodies than to use um, normal human structures. So this is uh, a control that they used with different variable regions, but tied together with that constant region as uh, the schematic is showing um, earlier. Uh, and so what this suggests is that the size, um, the smaller size helps, but you know, complexity also matters. So the smaller molecules can better neutralize virus. And one of the things I'm not showing you is that each of these different llama antibodies was um, characterized for its where exactly it binds along that HA um, sequence and structure uh, with various um, antibodies being able to bind not only to the top part of HA, which can be quite variable, but also to that stock region, which um, is a little more consistent between HA molecules. Now, of course, being able to neutralize in an in vitro situation like this is important, but it's more important that this um, potential therapeutic would be able to treat a, a sick animal or person. And so they used mouse models of different strains of influenza and showed that they were able to have at least some protection um, with all of these different strains, although um, different concentrations. So it took the maximum concentration, five mg per kg, um, with this H7 and 9 strain that they tested, whereas uh, it took um, a lower dose in order to protect mice against an H1N1 strain um, in this panel here. Now, these. Um, Now, these mice were already infected and showing signs of influenza um, when they were treated. It's important to keep in mind, although we're talking about antibodies, this is something that would be treated after um, one started to feel sick and was diagnosed with influenza. Uh, and so in, in this case, uh, as highlighted in the Los Angeles Times, um, a um, center, a, a researcher unrelated to this study who um, works at a center for vaccine and immunology discussed this particular um, this particular antibody, mega antibody, uh, as an approach that is similar to antivenom or something that you get, would give as a therapeutic, right? Um, a, a number of different outlets did highlight the use of llamas in generating these different antibodies. Uh, it was this story by Carl Zimmer in the New York Times that um, brought the mega antibody phrase to my mind, which I, I really liked. It's kind of funny because these are smaller antibody fragments or uh, smaller antibodies generated by the llamas, but they're tied together into this mega antibody. Um, and uh, so in some, some uh, promotions, they emphasize this llama um, uh, participation in generating this flu therapeutic, and in others, they talked about the monster antibody itself. And so where this goes in the future, um, whether this is better able to um, help with uh, vaccine uh, identifying important um, epitopes that are able to protect from um, when vaccinated or whether this becomes a therapeutic uh, has yet to be determined. So stay tuned to future Microbial Minutes sessions, and I'm sure we'll talk about this some more. All right, we're going to move on to our next story. This is a little bit different for us. This is from PLOS Pathogens. This is one of their pearls. Uh, and so this is not a primary um, research article, but more a meta-analysis that looks at a number of different primary literature. Uh, but it has some very interesting implications, and so I want to discuss the piece, which is called The Calendar of Epidemics, Seasonal Cycles of Infectious Diseases. Uh, and the take-home message from this is that epidemic calendars can help public health preparedness, uh, which might seem intuitive, but uh, we only apply this for very few diseases. So we know, of course, that influenza season is well characterized and observed in the southern hemisphere. Um, the influenza season is the summer, and in the northern hemisphere, it's in the winter. Uh, and this is just your reminder that if you haven't gotten your influenza shot um, or vaccination, now is the best time to do it uh, so that you have remaining immunity through uh, the entire influenza season, which can last through early March. So if you've been procrastinating, uh, this is your reminder that sometimes it pays to procrastinate. You will have good immunity if you still go out and get that flu shot. Uh, but influence is not the only disease that has seasonality. There are other infectious diseases that um, have been well known to have seasonal transmission cycles, things such as pertussis, which is whooping cough, or, or measles back when those um, were passed more 
uh, frequently we're known to be passed around in the summer between children. Um, and some epidemics or some infectious diseases even have multi-year intervals. We talked just the last session about enterovirus D68, uh, which has a bi annual or every other year cycle uh, that coincides with, um, in this case, I'm not showing enterovirus D68. I've been having a hard time finding the incidence of um, infection, but uh, of that particular virus, which I had seen previously on the CDC's website. Um, but they they also have this incidence of the acute um, uh, flaccid myelitis, um, which has a similar periodicity of every other year, 2014, 2016, 2018. Um, however, uh, many diseases have not had their seasonality tracked. Uh, and so preparing for that, you can imagine would, or, or understanding that that seasonality would help um, public health officials to prepare by stocking up on uh, therapeutics, by perhaps getting more vaccines um, uh, timed in a, and uh, administered in a timely fashion. And so Michaela Martinez um, looked through a number of different publications and she characterized the, the drivers of in, infectious disease seasonality into one of four broad categories, environmental factors, host behavior, host phenology, uh, and exo exogenous biotic factors. So these are things such as what the temperature is, what the humidity is, uh, whether there are vectors that, um, like such as mosquitoes that have their own seasonality and only transmit when the vectors are active, uh, whether there are behaviors um, that may, such as um, exposure outside or, or diet, which can also be seasonal, uh, that can affect um, the different infectious diseases. And she made a number of tables. Um, I'm just showing you part of one of them that lists a lot of different infectious diseases, whether or not they are seasonal and what that seasonality is driven by, uh, as well as references to where those studies were done. So for example, if you look at in Thailand or in Portugal, as was done with dengue and diphtheria here, you can imagine that the the factors that drive its seasonality may be the same, but depending uh, on what that factor is, it may differ a little bit in each of those places. Uh, and uh, she summarized the the piece with a quote from a polio epidemiologist um, who wrote in 1949, so um, many, many decades ago, that it must be admitted that the reasons for the seasonal incidence of poliomyelitis remain obscure. When they have been elucidated, perhaps much of the epidemiology of this disease will be solved. And polio continues to have um, a seasonality that is not well understood. Um, and so this was uh, summarized. She, she made a lovely um, epidemic calendar that has some um, incidences that you may already be familiar with, such as flu season, which goes from late November, we're just entering it now, all the way through um, February and sometimes into early March. Um, she talked uh, about the polio season, which had been documented in the past and varicella season. And she also added gonorrhea season, which had not really been on most people's calendars um, so far. And this is what uh, Gizmodo glommed onto when they wrote their headline, you know about flu season, but did you know about gonorrhea season? Uh, which is kind of clickbait, but they did um, get some nice quotes from uh, Martinez where she says that what I was finding is that there's no particular time of year where all diseases are prevalent uh, and a time of year when they're all gone. For each infectious disease, there's a time of year for that infection and every infection has its own season. And I think most people who are following along in this microbial minute session would uh, have guessed that or at least known, for example, that influenza has different seasons in different parts of the world. Um, there was another uh, very nice write-up in Scientific American, to every pathogen there is a season, kind of a um, spin on the birds uh, classic hit. Uh, and here what they highlight is that Martinez was um, surprised because she had not anticipated a similar pattern, a seasonal pattern in chronic infections, including HIV. Um, I was very surprised, she said. Uh, and those are the types of findings that can help public health officials to um, discover what it is, what factors are affecting, um, for example, transmission of chronic diseases that may um, may not have been known and could be potential points of halting that transmission cycle.
All right, we're going to move on to our last um, topic. And this is really a conglomeration of a number of different studies that I've seen out there that I thought related um, together. And so we're going to talk uh, first about a nature medicine paper, uh, then a, a bio archive piece, which has been accepted. I, I can't remember where it was accepted. So I grabbed the bio archive paper, um, but it has been peer reviewed. Um, and uh, has undergone revisions, any required revisions uh, as required by the peer review process. Uh, and then we will talk about a cell paper um, that kind of ties uh, some of this stuff together. And the take home message from this, from these papers, uh, is that some microbiome members, um, and that's microbiome constituents, the, the different microbial members of those microbiota, associate with eth ethnicity. Uh, and so what drives microbiome structure and function. We talk about this quite a bit on Microbial Minutes, about how diet, and in particular fiber, really comes into play um, in promoting uh, healthy structure and, and function, such as um, a, a healthy immune function of the gut microbiota, right? Uh, and, and many studies uh, in the past, for, for many years, people have looked at how geography plays a role in uh, microbiome structure and function. For example, um, looking at the microbiota of rural indigenous populations, such as those that are hunter-gatherers, have shown that they have much different um, diversity and much broader diversity um, than people who live in Western societies, right? And the, the loss of some of these um, diverse populations has actually been brought up as a potential explanation for some chronic diseases that we have in the West that are not experienced in other parts of the world. Uh, and so what these, these um, different studies are looking at is what happens to microbiomes in populations of diverse ethnic backgrounds. So comparing not just Western um, societies, but places such as the United States have um, many, many different people who make up its population. And within the United States or other Western um, societies, there could potentially be differences based on ethnicity. Uh, and that is what these different studies are going to look at. So we're just gonna summarize each of these uh, in a single slide very quickly. So the first study from Nature Medicine, it's actually out in August, um, but couples nicely with this bioarchive piece. So I, I thought it would make sense to talk about it now. It's titled, Depicting the Composition of Gut Microbiota in a Population with Varied Ethnic Origins but Shared Geography. So this is from the Helios study, which is healthy life in an urban setting. This is a, a Dutch study taking place in Amsterdam. Um, and this is where participants, uh, in this case, over 2,000 participants, have been recruited, but they the participants must be a member in one of six different ethnicities. Um, these are either one of the four largest um, minority ethnicities, um, uh, which are various places um, such as Suriname. Um, they also include um, Ghana, which is the fastest growing um, ethnicity within uh, Amsterdam, and those that are um, Dutch, that, that uh, have Dutch ancestry. And so in this case, they looked at the gut microbiota by 16S uh, ribosomal um, RNA sequencing, um, and they grouped them. So this is a PCA analysis where different samples are um, and individuals are shown with a single dot, and you can see the different ethnicities included in that Helios study uh, are um, indicated with different colored dots. Uh, and although it looks very... Um, overlapping, right? There are a number of different dots in all, of all different colors that, throughout all of these different quadrants. You can see that there are some uh, slight patterns. And so in this case, you see these blue dots, which are the South Asian Surinamese, are mostly in this lower right-hand quadrant, maybe a couple over here. If you look at the Dutch, which are the red dots, you can see the upper right-hand quadrant has most of the red dots with maybe some of the upper left-hand as well. Um, uh, and so what the researchers were able to conclude by looking at the effect of ethnicity on these groupings is that individuals who live in the same city tend to share similar gut microbiota characteristics with others of their same ethnic background. Now, this is only a tendency. It's not um, uh, prescriptive necessarily. Um, but they did find that ethnicity explained these differences that you see here better than other factors such as diet, which um, we know can also affect uh, can also affect microbiome makeup. And so this is looking at different um, ethnicities within a single city within Europe. 
Now, the next study, this uh, one that's from BioArchive, and I, I think it's PLOS pathogens, but I can't quite remember, um, takes subjects who have participated in either um, the Citizen Science Project, the American Gut Project, or the Human Microbiome Project. And from this, they were able to gather um, nearly 1,700 individuals who self-identified into one of four different ethnicities. Um, and similarly, these were samples that were assessed by 16S ribosomal um, sequencing. Um, and they were grouped uh, by this same similarity um, metric. And once again, it looks like a large conglomeration of different um, colors overlapping with one another. Here, the ethnicities are again in the different colored dots with um, African-American, Asian or Pacific Islander, Caucasian or Hispanic being represented with different colors. Uh, and what this group found was that there were 12 different microbial genre or families that vary by ethnicity. There were others that did not vary. Um, uh, uh, however, once again, ethnicity explained differences better than other factors such as um, diet, I believe, uh, sex, uh, and age. Were all, oh, uh, and they also looked at obesity. So these are, these are the um, negatives that show that there is not really an effect of these other factors that one might suspect um, would influence the microbiome composition, but in fact do not have a, a significant association. Um, and you can see here that a number of the different microbial genera were found um, within uh, different members of the, of the self-identified ethnicities. And these are people from across the United States. So rather than only looking at the population of a single city, this is looking at people who have participated from across the country since these are federally funded um, or nationally funded uh, projects. Um, uh, and so there are a lot of similarities, but there are also some specific differences. The authors point to this Christian Senelisier, uh, probably saying that wrong, but as one of the most um, affected or most associated with different ethnicities, so this little group here. Um, and you can see that there are some of these different microbial groups, such as this YS2F in the hot pink here, that were found um, only uh, in significant proportions within the um, Hispanic ethnicity, self-identifying ethnicity, for example. Um, and so I, I want to take a moment here and, and point out that ethnicity is not the same as race, um, particularly when using self-identified uh, ethnicity. This is um, a marker that is tied very close to uh, things such as socioeconomic status, geography, family, um, genetics, could be dietary or um, uh, healthcare practices. Um, and so it, this study is is very interesting in that it does find differences, um, uh, but it's not determinative in, as to what those differences are. Uh, so why do this study in the first place? Uh, well, these are the types of studies that are going to be required as personalized medicine becomes uh, something that people are able to apply to various microbiome practices uh, when, for example, a physician um, prescribes some sort of intervention that may be uh, may be supposed to change a gut microbiome makeup in a way that, that has some sort of health uh, benefit, it's important to know that that health benefit would be equally felt by people who have various factors that, that might affect um, that, that very complex um, environment of the gut microbiota. Um, and so this next study is, is very interesting because the first two really point to differences within populations. Um, whereas this cell paper, um, titled U.S. Immigration Westernizes the Human Gut Microbiome, shows the uh, more the, the homogenization that occurs as people adopt a Western lifestyle. So in this case, the um, scientists studied 514 individuals of Hmong or Karen um, background who are living in Thailand. These are two different ethnic groups who live within Thailand. Um, and they also looked at, at the uh, immigration, immig uh, groups who had immigrated uh, of these ethnicities within the US, and that included both first and second generation um, immigrants, so either those that had moved themselves or the children of immigrants, uh, as well as uh, 19 Karen individuals, uh, both before and after their immigration to the US from Thailand. Uh, and so what they found was that immigration from a non-Western country, such as Thailand, to the US is associated with the immediate loss of gut microbiome diversity, uh, and that the um, the longer that one had been living within the U.S., um, uh, the more um, 
the the more diversity was lost, and this, these effects were um, increased with with length of U.S. residence. So the longer that uh, either an individual or generations had been um, living within the U.S., as well as obesity. Uh, they the group was able to point to um, diet as one of the um, variables that affected this. So in this case, they tied together, for example. Bacteroides uh, prevotella relative abundances among either um, the Karen or the Hmong living in Thailand in these first two um, uh, groups here, and Karen or Hmong uh, first generation, so those that had themselves immigrated to the U.S., or the Hmong second generation, so those whose parents had moved. And you can see that the the longer uh, that the Hmong were living in the United States, the closer they were to this control group, which is um, European, um, uh, well, United States um, residents of European ancestry. Uh, and you can see similar patterns of, uh, of these box plots when you look at different dietary um, characteristics. So total calories uh, is a little bit different. It's not, it's not crazy different. But when we start to look at percent of calories from total sugar, that goes um, up significantly among the, the United States residents of European ancestry and also with those um, Hmong and Karen peoples who had moved into uh, the United States compared to those that were living still in Thailand. Similar um, patterns were seen with percent of calories from total fat. Um, and the authors uh, say that this may account for some, but not all of the differences which they saw. Uh, and so this was a very interesting set of studies to follow. Um, of course, this is not, we're just choosing this arbitrary time point to talk about it. This is an area of ongoing research in a number of different um, aspects. Uh, one of the interesting things was to see in real time the discussion among scientists um, involved with this study on Twitter uh, as people um, brought up the the problems of using ethnicity and the problems of um, uh, not working very closely with social scientists. Uh, and this is actually a very nice discourse where the um, scientists came to an agreement that there is, of course, more studies that needed to be done. It was also interesting to see this in uh, several write-ups in mainstream outlets because they focused on one or the other of these studies, whereas really the first set of studies shows that people have varied um, microbiota makeup based on their ethnic origins, uh, even if they live in the same place. But the second study, this cell study, says that those those microbiota become more homogenized. Uh, and so how do we, uh, as Microbial Minutes sessions listeners, think about these together? I, I think that there, the, the take-home message from this is that there remains um, differences that that are found among different ethnicities, especially when they're the, those ethnicities are geographically separated. But as um, conditions become more similar, such as living in the same geographic country or city, those differences um, become uh, slightly less uh, and may be maintained perhaps by uh, some of the differences that, that we discussed earlier, uh, things that, that are um, different between populations living in the same place, such as dietary or, or family or healthcare or genetic differences between those different um, ethnic populations. Uh, I'm sure that we will revisit this issue on Microbial Minutes, um, and I'd love to know what you think. Um, so, you know, feel free to leave a comment or ask a question. All right, um, that's going to wrap it for what's been happening in the microbial sciences in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've talked about the wild giraffes, which are colonized with drug-resistant bacteria and how that is a One Health issue. We talked about special antibodies from llamas that may hold the key to the flu cure. We talked about epidemic calendars that can help with public health preparedness. And we talked about how some microbiome members associate with ethnicity. I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, I hope that you um, got a lot out of this. And if you have any stories that you want us to cover on a fu future microbial sciences session, feel free to leave a link. Uh, we're happy to discuss those. Talk with you next time.